Hello, I'm Rachel Babin from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club podcast. Welcome to our first ESMO 2021 special episode. Today's episode is focused on early bird practice changing data. We cover Keynote 716, both the breast and lung destiny studies, Zenith 20, Tulip, Keynote 826, COVID, and much more. So join us to digest the key ESMO updates with Eva Segaloff, Craig Underhill, and Hans Prennan. We hope you have a few laughs too. As ever, you'll find links to all of the papers, bios, and Twitter handles in the notes on our website. For regular news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter on oncologynews.com.au. It's free and it's a great way to support the OJC. This is Rachel Babin and this is the Oncology Podcast. G'day, g'day, g'day. Or should, should I say bonjour, 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 because this week we are, don't laugh at my French accent. You, okay, Craig, you do it. Okay, we're going to get Hans because it's his second name. Bonjour. Bonjour tout le monde. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so Hans. Can, you, can you do the intro, please, Hans? We were metaphorically all in Paris, and I have to say, I'm on the Neuroendocrine Organising Committee, and everyone else was in Paris. I had to give up my oral, and my my compensation was I got to judge the Neuroendocrine posters and award the prize. So I'm a big loser of the week. Hans, how come you didn't go to ESMO in person? I wasn't invited. I think only the speakers uh, could go there. Ah, that's true. That's true. So did you listen to it? Actually, I listened and I went through all the papers. And as you know, we're already recording before ESMO is finished. So we studied really good on the abstract. Yeah, no, this is a first, actually. We we decided that you, our lovely audience, are sick of getting post-ESMO four and six weeks down the track. So we've been working really hard and we've got our ESMO practice changing early bird edition out now. Craig, are you excited? Super excited. I mean, it's only the meeting's just literally just finished. And actually, there were heaps of practice changing abstracts. It is now as good as ASCO, and I think virtual being the the big equaliser, but there was some fantastic uh, stuff. I also like the fact they have three presidential symposium, and actually in, in number three, we got a neuroendocrine trial in a plenary because it was a, a randomised trial in pheochromocytoma, so super rare, and that's why it got there. So you don't get that chance in ASCO with the one plenary. And we've just had World Lung, and last year we did a whole edition on World Lung because there was some great stuff, which I think was part of lockdown, but that was World Lung 2020 came into this year, and there was another World Lung, and there wasn't really a huge amount of practice-changing stuff. So because it was only a week before ESMO. So it's just too much, isn't it, to have two international meetings so close. But anyway, it was a good meeting. What a shame we couldn't actually go to Paris. Well, the Arc de Triomphe was wrapped up anyway in toilet paper, so not as uh, good as seeing it in the flesh. Okay, so Hans, what have you got for us practice changing? So for this edition, I selected actually one paper or one presentation and I think is a very important one in melanoma. It's in high risk stage two melanoma treatment with adjuvant pembrolizumab. The keynote study is called keynote 716 but these numbers I can never remember. So it's a phase three trial and as you know for stage three melanoma we already give adjuvant immune therapy but for high risk stage 2b or 2c with negative sentinel lymph nodes. These patients were randomized in this study with pembrolizumab up to one year or placebo. And the pembrolizumab was given every three weeks. They included almost 1,000 patients, so to be exact, 976. And what they found was that there is a prolonged 
recurrent free survive voor Pembro versus placebo. De hazard ratio was 0.65, so this is really good. But the median is not reached yet. But this already shows that pembrolizumab has a role in the adjuvant setting. You maybe wonder about the immune-related mediated adverse events, and we saw indeed in 36% of the cases, surprisingly also 8% of the placebo. And mostly there were thyroid problems, grade 1 or 2, so in general it's quite safe. The main questions I have with this abstract is what does this actually mean for sentinel lymph node? Should we still do this sentinel lymph node dissection in the future if you want to give anyhow based on bad factors such as alteration or deepness of the tumor uh, adjuvant immune therapy? You also know there are a lot of vaccines currently in development for stage two. So what is the role there? And I think we also have to wait the overall survival data, of course, And some people wonder, okay, but what do we do if you give in stage two adjuvant pembrolizumab and they have a recurrence, let's say a couple of months later, after you stop the pembro, should we give again immune therapy? Yes or no? I think we have to think about that and also maybe develop new trials that can answer this question. Amazing. So that really is practice changing hands. I wonder if we'll get to the stage of having organ preservation for the skin and no surgery even. Yeah, that would be indeed uh, a good study to perform. Mm. Great. Well, I've got a practice changing one with a drug that uh, Craig loves to say, trastuzumab, deruxtecan, TDXD. Now, this was the plenary presented by Javier Cortez, looking as uh, one commentator pointed out, two novel therapies head to head, which is great because often we see the new therapy being compared with an old standard and we have another new therapy also compared with an old standard, but we don't often get the two new therapies head to head. So these are patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, randomized phase three destiny breast O3 study. Many of us will be familiar now with the destiny series on this agent. This was an open label study in patients previously treated with trastuzumab and ataxane. So a second line study. They saw complete responses actually in 16% of patients and there was excitement that maybe we're even going to cure metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. So TDXD significantly improved progression-free survival, which was the primary endpoint, compared with TDM1 with a hazard ratio of 0.28 and the p-value was 7.8 times 10 to the minus 22. So that's pretty nice. And medium PFS was not yet reached for the TDXD and 6.8 months for TDM1. So the estimated 12-month overall survival rate, so these are estimates, uh, the differences are 94.1 versus 85.9 that did not cross the pre-specified boundary for significance, but they can't yet estimate the overall median overall survival because they need to wait for a bit longer. And they are postulating that once this data is mature, they would anticipate an improvement in overall survival. So this is a new standard of care in second line. It's good that because it knocks off one expensive therapy for another rather than leaving us in a quandary of which expensive therapy uh, to use. Obviously, there's lots more studies where it's got to be moved into first line or combination of her anti-HER2 therapies. Is it better than trastuzumab alone or TDM1 first line? So trastuzumab, deruxtecan. Uh, Craig, you're lucky you don't have to say that this recording. I do have to say trastuzumab, deruxtecanema, because don't forget about destiny in lung cancer. So was the breast paper published in the New England Journal? It was concurrently published in the New England Journal. Was the lung paper? It was. So, well, tell us about it then. So same drug, 
trastuzumab deruxtecan, this time in lung cancer for patients harboring HER2 mutations. Heavily pretreated, that mean number of lines was two. There was, there was one to seven was a range and really quite impressive results. The medium follow-up of 13.1 months, progression-free survival, eight months, overall survival, 17.8 months. So that's, you know, we don't expect lung cancer patients to survive on average 17.8 months after two lines of treatment and then getting a new drug. Same sort of toxicity, we're on the lookout for interstitial lung disease. For a group of heavily treated patients with HER2 mutated non-small cell lung cancer, which, you know, is a substantial number. I forgot to look it up before we came on. It's about 8 to 10%, I think, of that pie graph that we're used to seeing now with all the mutations in lung cancer. And so great results and probably a new standard if you can get access to this drug for these patients. Yeah, so let's talk about the interstitial lung disease because I didn't mention that. There was a difference between the breast paper and the lung patients in the incidence and partly it relates to actually the doses of the drug were different in the two trials, which is interesting. Lower dose in lung, I think because there were concerns about the pre-existing state of the lungs in patients with lung cancer. So it was 6.4 milligrams per kilograms every three weeks in lung. So is breast, is it different? I didn't realise that. So and as you both have difficulties in pronouncing Trastuzma Drextican, do you know what the brand name is? Oh, it's some weird groovy name, isn't it? It's NHER2. So HER2 is written H-E-R-T-U. So let's talk about ILD Craig because I didn't mention it, but that's a super important feature. And there was a significant difference between the toxicity in the breast trial and the toxicity in the lung trial. So tell us about the lung ILD rates. Yeah, so in lung cancer, it was 26.4%. There was 90 patients in it, so mostly they grade 1 and 2. There were four grade 3 events, but there were two patients of the 91 who died of this toxicity. So it's a higher dose. It was 6.2 milligrams per kilogram. But going forward in Destiny 02, it's going to be 5.4, which is the same as the breast dose because there was less toxicity in the breast dose which was Hans, I think you had that. Yeah, as, as you know, in the, in the breast study, they were actually, they started with different dose levels. So they had three dose levels, 5.4, 6.4, and 7.4 in this first part. And then they decided also based on PK data, etc., to continue with the 5.4 data for part two. And in that group, you saw not that many interstitial lung disease. So any grade was about 13.6%, but only 0.5 grade 3 and nobody grade 4 or grade 5. So I think this dose is actually, it seems to be better than the higher dose 6.4. In the lung discussion, they did have a bit of a discussion about that benefit risk and saying they actually need to further evaluate the safety profile going on. So I think it shows the importance of trials. So anyway, in Destiny 02 lung, they'll be doing the lower dose 5.4. It also shows you the devil's in the detail, isn't it? Because top line, you would miss the fact that they were different doses in the different trials. Yeah, that's right. One of the important outcomes in breast, obviously, is CNS penetration, given the predominance disease, you know, predominance of HER2-positive breast metastases in the brain, whether that's an, a dose effect. So that's being looked at as well in Destiny 12. There's some other HER2 agents around. There's a new one called posiotinib. So that was presented as well. Anyway, we'll, people can click on the link, but that had quite an interesting response rate and disease control rate of up to 75% as a first-line treatment. Yeah, and we had the TULIP trial, which was a later line metastatic breast trial with trastuzumab duocarmazine that's had reasonable efficacy but quite a lot of toxicity. So, look, we're really getting a lot of value out of targeting her too, and it's one where you know, so we can keep targeting it with different agents. So I remember years ago when for her too was first identified as a terrible prognostic factor and those patients did really, really badly. So 
it really is the era of molecular medicine. Okay, enough with the corny phrases, metaphors, or whatever you want to say. Let's go on to another practice changing trial. Now, there was a great gift from your friend doc, at Dr. Steve Martin on Twitter. And it was, uh, it came from one of those, uh, you know, those Asia PAC conferences or, or world leader conferences where someone arrives and they get a garland put around their neck and they get one from every country. And so it's got somebody getting so many garlands. They've got about, they become covered in it. And it was like, this is Pembro at Esmo. <laughs> just getting one more. So I'm going to talk to you about something presented also at the first presidential symposium, Late Breaking Abstract 2, Keynote 826, a randomised double-blind phase 3 study of Pembro plus chemo versus placebo plus chemo for the treatment first line of persistent recurrent or metastatic cervical cancer. And we were really lucky recently to have Professor Ian Fraser give us a presentation on cervix cancer, a global initiative to try and get everybody vaccinated. We'll put the link in. They've made a documentary all about cervix cancer and vaccinating the world to prevent cancer. And uh, it was lovely to have Ian Fraser introduce the film and, and make comments on it. But you know, we're a little bit spoiled in Western cultures not seeing a lot of this terrible disease that certainly has a huge burden in low and middle income countries. And so these therapies, although uh, obviously countries have to work out how they can afford it, will have huge impact. So this was 617 patients who had not had any previous systemic therapy for recurrent or metastatic disease and who were no longer candidates for any sort of curative therapy with surgery or radiation. And they had standard chemotherapy with either cis or carbo, with paclitaxel and also bevacizumab at the uh, discretion of the investigator and then they were randomized to receive either placebo or Pembro and they showed a statistically significant 33% improvement in overall survival so 24.4 versus 16.5 months hazard ratio 0.67 with the 95% CI 0.54 to 0.84 highly statistically significant also significantly longer PFS and there was no biomarker in terms of CPS score more than one or more than 10. But again, this pattern where we're not really getting data with CPS zero or less than one. So the other factors were that it didn't seem to matter if BEV was used or not. This effect was independent. You had an improved response rate and duration of response. And the next step is really to an improved quality of life, I should say as well. And the next step is to perhaps drop the chemo and just use IO in these patients. So simultaneously published in the New England Journal, a landmark study, another lay around the Pembro, Pembro neck. I just wanted to make a comment on the cervix one, Eva. Look, thankfully, it's become very much a niche tumour in Australia. So Christopher Steers, our in-house sort of gynae cancer expert and his PI in uh, virtually all of our gynae oncology trials, and I said to him, are you excited about that? He said, well, I am, but thankfully, it's now such a rare, rare tumour. It's not in large parts of the world, but thankfully in Australia, due to vaccines and screening, it's become much more rare. Well, I, I don't actually think that it's all over Australia. So here in southeast Melbourne, in the uh, population that we see surprising numbers, and these are in people who aren't vaccinated, people who are often younger women, and it's still a, an issue, But but you're right in many countries. What about Belgium, Hans? I was actually looking it up because I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it's too predictable now, this journal club. It's supposed to be spontaneous. I don't know the absolute numbers, but we st I still see quite some metastatic 
uh, cervical cancer, so it's still prevalent. Yep. And let's not forget about our indigenous population either. In the Those top five groups. or six cancers in our um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with cancer, unfortunately. Yep. So I think that that's really a, an important study. So, Craig, did you have another practice changer? I, I've got a few for you, Eva. Let's call them practice changing quick bites. So there was some data from the Pacific study. So I know you're a fan of the post-registration study. So this was a a real-world study of patients receiving dervalumab after chemoradiotherapy for unresectable stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer. So the Pacific study led to the registration of that practice change in many countries, giving maintenance dervalumab after chemoradiotherapy. So Pacific R was in a large pool of patients post-registration. Presumably it was like an, I imagine it was like an access program. There was 1,400 patients enrolled independent of pd one So basically the results were pretty similar to the Pacific study. There was a median progression-free survival was actually better. It was 21 months versus 16 months. And so... It's a really not a practice changing, but a practice affirming that this is probably, you know, considered to be standard of care for patients who can receive it for those who receive chemotherapy. But the interesting, probably practice changing part was a retrospective analysis of the original data, uh, looking at patients who had driver genomic alterations. So patients with EGFR, ALK1, ROS1, BRAF, KRAS mutations, there was 323 patients from the original study. And interestingly, the patients with EGFR, BRAF V600E and ALK mutations did badly. So there was, you know, not huge numbers, but it was really probably a, a pause and we probably need further studies and analysis. But we maybe should avoid treating patients with ALK1, BRAF V600E or EGFR mutations with IO as part of their maintenance treatment. But actually this is something that is already known, eh? that no, because I'm not a lung expert, but people know that when once you have a targeted agent that you can give, that they usually don't respond to immune therapy. Yeah, that's right. Well, they might actually do you know worse. So it's interesting. You know, again, or be praise be to studies, clinical trials to work this out. And not all lung cancers are, are created equally. It's really a collection of different tumours that all start in the lung with different driver mutations. And I, I think if there's evidence of harm, we've got to really get, you know, I mean, evidence of futility is is poor, poor patient has toxicity, cost the system a lot of money, but evidence of harm is that one notch above. So is this practice changing? Will people change on this? I don't know. I think people will be circumspect, I would say. But yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see in the weeks and months ahead what the field really thinks about this data once it's published in full. Was it an academic group or was it the uh, company doing some uh, phase four? That's a really good question, Eva. And I'm not really sure. Of, well, was it published? That, but... Were there, what who, What did the editorial people, did they declare conflict of interest? Come on, we've covered this before in the OJC. It was an abstract in the last two days. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's been published as yet. It didn't get a New England Journal publication simultaneously. Fair enough. All right. So, uh, Hans, have you got a couple of quick bites for us, please? So, actually, I followed the uh, mini oral session of GI non-colorectal, so usually the, the upper GI, because I was hoping to get enough novel data as we saw in previous meetings so you know that everything was about gastric in the previous ASCO meeting last year ESMO meeting so I was really hoping to see something but actually there was not that much news so to summarize there was data on anti-PD-1 and data on HER2 
as you would expect. But the date on, on TPD-1 was actually two trials with Sintilimab. That's the one that they use in Asia as an anti-PD-1. And two uh, first-line studies, they were called Orient-15 and Orient-16. One was in squamous esophageal, one was in gastric and junctions. And actually, to conclude, both studies show that it works fine in first line. And maybe one message is that the CPS score seems to be preferred over the TPS score. But I think we can have a full podcast about PDL1 scoring, so we'll not go into debate about this. But it seems that CPS is better in upper GI. But the question is still, what is the role globally? And when you looked on the data on HER2 positive gastric injunction, there was this phase two study with first line nivolumab, trastuzumab, chemo versus nivolumab, ipilimumab, trastuzumab. And actually, it seems that CTLA4 blockade with dual HER2 anti PD1 is not enough. So you still have to add the chemotherapy, which is maybe a signal there. And then also, we had some data about guess what? trastuzumab deruxtecan in gastric cancer patients, but in this case, in second-line study in Western patients, because a lot of data that we have is also from Asia. And it seems that there is a similar response in Western and Eastern patients. So also in gastric cancer, it's a player that will stay there. In her too, easier to say. Okay, Craig, do you have any more updates? Quick bites, practice changing early bird. Practice changing early bird, adjuvant lung. So for patients, this is the IM Power 010 trial, giving adjuvant immunotherapy, this time a tezolizumab, for patients with stage 1B to 3A non small cell lung cancer. So it's possibly another Adura. We saw a Dura study of adjuvant osimertinib in patients with EGFR mutated lung cancer. So this is in patients receiving immunotherapy. Saw some stratification according to pd one status. Hans, you'll like that. So this is for people who received adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy and then were randomised to receive a tezolizumab for 12 months compared with best supportive care. The risk of progression or death, the hazard ratios with the tezolizumab versus best supportive care according to pd one status was for pd one less than 1, 0.97, so not significant. For the pd one 1 to 49%, which is how a lot of studies cut these patients, 0.87, so not there was a confidence intervals crossed 1. But for the pd high, more than 50%, um, the hazard ratios were 0.43 amongst 182 randomised patients. So the discussant considered this practice changing outcomes for the interim disease-free analysis. There was a lot of discussion then about, you know, whether we accept, do we accept disease-free survival or wait for overall survival in the adjuvant setting? Well, we've never heard that debate before, have we? No. So it's a recurrent theme at the moment, isn't it? Well, you know, it's sort of like everyone's, it's just accepted now. Like Mm. (laughs) you discuss it, but you say even so. Mm. Yep. So provocative, if these drugs are active in advanced disease, you would expect that they would have a benefit early on. But I guess it's about A, the cost, B, the um, selecting out the appropriate patients and pausing at the risk of creating practice-changing toxicity, inducing immunologically based diseases in these patients. So, you know, we've got to be sure we know which ones to treat and which ones not. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Okay, Hans, you've done your short bite, so I'll do just a couple on the theme of COVID and cancer. So there was a presentation about long COVID reporting one in six cancer patients uh, get long COVID, most persistently respiratory symptoms and fatigue, uh, data showing that patients who were on current anti-systemic therapy at the time they contracted COVID-19, about 85% were able to continue after their COVID 
nineteen resolve. But I think it's going to be a, a disease that we're going to have to figure in lo- how to manage people with long COVID. And then at the presidential three symposium a few hours ago, so how hot off the press is this? There were two studies looking at uh, response at COVID-19 and cancer patients. One was the VOICE trial looking at patients only with solid tumours, no hematological malignancies, showing uh, neutralising antibody response and some T-cell mark response markers, in particular interferon gamma, were not greatly different in patients with solid tumours. Uh, which was interesting. And then there was a more nuanced study that comes from the Marsden and the Francis Crick Institute, around 600 patients looking at, uh, again, antibody response, but in particular neutralising antibodies to variants of concern and including haematological patients who've been treated with anti-CD20 agents showing impairment of response. So one of these, the voice trial will be published in Lancet Oncology. The other trial is up on preprint. And of course, a shout out to our own Australian CIROSNET study. We've got a couple of points of difference with this data that's being presented and uh, hope to be able to contribute shortly into this space. So, shameless plug for own research over. It's time to say goodbye, I think. Hans? Yes, indeed. It was an interesting podcast. All right, early birds. See you later. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.